The problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Welcome to Sarah's Country, where we discuss the matters that matter most to farming, food and fashion for our discerning global consumers. From the most beautiful paradise known as Aotearoa, New Zealand, I'm your host Sarah Perry, and I have the best job in the world, I think. Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday evenings, we broadcast live from 7 o'clock in alliance with the tremendously passionate team at Farmers Weekly. Now, wherever you are joining the show around the country and around the world, I hope your day has finished, for those watching live, of course, and for those listening on demand, it has starting and looking like it's going to be filled with one of gratitude, you know, because the position that we are in, particularly here at the bottom of the world, could be a hell of a lot worse. Now, I reckon one of the grounding places that we can actually find is sometimes, don't you think, in the faces of the innocents of our next generation, our, our whakapapa, you know, for us to just remember uh, why we're actually doing this. You know, we're doing it for them. We're doing it for that next generation. And what is truly important is is time, time with them, uh, time uh, and it takes to be able to nurture uh, them as, as little ones. And of course, uh, what we are, why we're doing what we're doing. It doesn't all have to be done yesterday, you know. But um, I just wanted to touch on this because I don't want to be morbid, but I do want to continue to reflect on the lives that have been lost at sea and the sinking of this live export ship caught up in the typhoon. I mean, it does really put in perspective how short life is. I mean, we, we do get this every day. Um, it's It doesn't have to take such tragedy to continuously talk about this. But I feel like I want to talk about this because, you know, seeing the little eyes uh, of our young ones is so important to be grateful for why we're doing what we're doing in terms of getting up every day uh, at dusk through till dawn. I grew up in Central Otago and back in the early 90s, uh, you know, we made our own fun on the farm and, and kids today still do after school uh, and through the weekends. Our parents were working so hard. We didn't have the luxury of doing things with our parents in the weekends. I mean, I'm seeing this all the time now around uh, Christchurch and living here. Kids are doing things. There's an array of things to do uh, to stimulate them and, and events to go to, etc. So, you know, I, I this is why I really, really love to start the show off about these types of human issues and in, in the, I feel like they are the matters that matter most because it's our time to take a little bit of reflection from farming before we get into the issues. This is where I'm going to bring in Dan. Dan is uh, just joined us. Aperium Media team is exploding as we move to Titan from my home very shortly. Dan is sitting alongside Joel, Joel Rock, if you've just joined us as our producer. And uh, I'm really loving hearing his stories every day about being a father of one to a very fast moving boy. Dan, um, I know we can't see you on video tonight, but what sort of types of missions do you go on with uh, Will around town? Well, it's, uh, I guess it's mainly around the country and we're fortunate to live in a small town and get to know Got to know some farmers and getting getting out and about on the farms for a little city boy and my son. It's um it's been great. Um, just riding on tractors and checking out the drenching and watching the farm dogs, um, and just all the activities uh, around the rivers, the Waimak, the Rakaia. It's uh yeah, it's coming here from Sydney. It's definitely definitely a bit different. Oh, that's so awesome. So it's not like we have to stimulate them by taking them uh, to all these parks, etc. So audiences watching live, those moments that you've, you really stop and be present with your little people, either children or grandchildren, or, or when your children were younger, please share with us in the comments, what are the special things that you do uh, with them or you did with them when they were younger? I really would love to share this uh, with you throughout the show. It, might make me a little bit clucky, but um, I'd love to read them out. It'd be very, very special uh, as we go through what is coming up on the show. And of course, those who obviously comment often, if I don't see those comments coming through, I will give you a poke. I know many of you that are watching, I know you like taking your sons and daughters fishing and hunting and riding horses and even the creative joys of maybe baking and cooking. 
what are some of those special things that you uh, as parents or um, used to do with your parents that you really, really treasure. My dad reckons um, white baiting's a hell of a treat and um, I have actually cottoned on that you do need to take a very thick book as well. Now turning to tonight's stories, after 7.20, Rangitaki Rivers Catchment Collective Chair Roger Dalrymple wants to see the change made from the bottom up at local river catchment levels on freshwater quality rather than being forced on them from the top down. He's going to join us uh, after 7.30 and uh, then, of course, excuse me, we... (laughs) I'm just going to go down here to my script. Steve Carden from Palmu. Profits are looking very good for Palmu. 91% up from 2019. Despite COVID, the drought, and of course, deer prices. Uh, Steve Carden's going to join us after 7.20, 7.30, sorry. And Malcolm Ellis uh, from LAC. To close the show, sex semen demand is uh, triple, I believe. And this is because there is a demand to drive down uh, bobby calves. Of course, or, uh, of course, replacements from heifers. And, uh, but coming up after the break, Danny Templeman is going to join us from Osprey. Hawke's Bay's TB strain has been linked to feral pigs, uh, not the movement of livestock. Have they known about this for some time? And why are they not using the powers under the Biosecurity Act? After the break, Danny is going to join us um, to discuss the developments in this TB strain. This is Sarah's Country. DNA typing of the TB strain of the outbreak recently in Hawke's Bay by Osprey has indicated that the spread has been from wildlife and not from livestock. Feral pigs, in fact. However, Osprey is having a hard time getting access to the land where the outbreak is believed to be and is being held up now in a Maori court injunction. Joining us now to discuss is Extension Manager for Osprey, Danny Templeman. Danny, can you give us a bit of a timeline on how Osprey have discovered the strains trace so far? Yes, Sarah. So um, it's, it's been a bit of a, um, a a long story, really. So in 2018, we actually undertook a pig survey um, up in the area to to have a look at the, the the pigs and see if there's any TB in them. So the pigs are a very crucial tool in our, I guess, our diagnostics of, of TB in, in the wildlife because what they do is they actually they like vacuum cleaners of the environment. So they'll go and eat dead possums um, and become infected from the disease. What we do know, though, is they don't pass the disease back on to wildlife. So um, back in 2018, we, we did the survey and found three three positive pigs um, out of a, a sample of 30. Okay, so this particular block that we're talking about, the Waipunga area of the Napier um, Taupo Highway, what is going on and why are you having objection in regards to doing what we believe Osprey should do, pest control? Yeah, so I, I guess land access issues are always something we're dealing with. So, so not everyone agrees, I guess, with our with our methods and potentially even the TB program. So, so this is just another one of those um, land access issues that we're sort of working with the landowners and discussing the benefits of the TB plan and hopefully the benefits to their their land as well, um, and, and working through that process with them. It is a real challenging situation, and I want to get onto forestry shortly because that is another bounding uh, land use to our livestock farmers that they worry about in terms of their um, responsibilities, I suppose, as landowners. Do these Māori blocks understand their obligations uh, to the nation, and is there anything that we can do in terms of legalities in, in form of act, uh, act amendments or anything like this? Because it's quite a major problem. We've done so great with the TB eradication program to not let it get escape us again. Yes, yeah, so so I guess um, you know, again going back to it, land use and land access is is, is 
continual issue for, for Osprey. So uh, we, we do have powers under the Biosecurity Act. Um, however, before we go down the track of trying to enforce those, uh, what we try and do is work with the landowners because for TB control to be sustainable and actually get our TB goals of TB freedom by 2026 in all, all cattle and deer herds, um, we actually have to go on the property you know, on a yearly basis, sometimes um, for up to 10 years. So so we need to actually develop a relationship with, with the, the people and, and I guess you know talk to them about those benefits and I guess the New Zealand benefit of eradicating TB eventually. Um, in the story here by Colin Wallacecroft in this week's Farmers Weekly, the Tata Ranga um, Kenasi Trust Land. Now, when you get into these um, Māori land blocks and there's multiple different uh, shareholders a part of these, how on earth do you get the full understanding of all stakeholders and the importance of this? Yeah, I mean that, that is the really challenging challenging aspect of, of any of this consultation, making sure we're talking to the right people and and actually also listening to the right people. So so it's sort of true and valid consultation, um, and that's something that you know, we continue to work on and, and hopefully get better at because you know this is a vital this particular area is vital for the for the Hawks Bay to get that controlled. Um, currently, we're doing around a hundred and uh, 55,000 hectares of control um, surrounding the area. Um, to put it in context, this area is around 12,000 hectares. What is the message to pig hunters in the area? Yeah, so so pigs, I guess, uh, as we discussed it, they're, they're not actually a, a, a transmission host to cattle and deer, but where they can become a problem is if, if someone's gone and hunted in a TB risk area and taken a, a pig out of there and then sort of maybe t- taken it home and, and skinned it out and things like that, and then they go and dump the head, or, head and, and I guess the, the hunting waste you know, down the riverbed or something like that, that can actually restart the TB infection because a possum or a ferret can, can uh, scavenge on that, and then uh, the way we go again, and, and unfortunately then we have to go back and control the possum. So so just being careful about what you do with that hunting remains and you know burying it or, or leaving it where you hunt it is really the best thing for us. So in terms of Hawke's Bay and infected herds, where are we at as of this week? Yeah, this week, so so we've got currently in, uh, 19 infected herds. Um, however, the really positive part of that is that currently we've got 15 of those have had a clear test. And, and to come back to a clear status, those herds have to complete two clear tests within, uh, with six months in between. So, so you know, a lot of them are halfway there. Um, and currently we've got six herds under, um, under investigation. And you're inviting submissions at the moment under the TB Free Possum Control Aerial Operations. Uh, what are you sort of encouraging individuals and organisations uh, to do and be a part of this consultation process? Yeah, so this is, I guess, our first step of um, the consultation around around any aerial operations we're proposing to do. So what we're wanting, um, you know, general public, uh, industry, anyone really, to go onto our website, have a look at what we're proposing and why, um, and then to submit submit what their thoughts are and, and, and we'll reply to those. Mm. Oh, it would have been a, a big year for you, Danny, um, I'm sure. And, of course, um, regional extension managers now are on the ground. I'm sure farmers are really appreciating uh, having a, a clearer line of communication. How are you finding uh, your dealings with farmers, particularly in this outbreak in Hawke's Bay? Yeah, so uh, that's a, a big aspect of, you know, Osprey's been through a bit of an organisational change and, and moving to a more of a regional footprint um, and, and having, um, I guess, decisions being made at a regional level. So we recently just did some uh, farmer um, meetings up in the Hawke's Bay um, and, and I think the, the the feedback was that they think we're on the right track and there's been significant change and we're, we're here to sort of work with farmers and make sure we deliver for them. So um, that, that was certainly the message we gave them. Hey, thank you so much, Danny, for taking the time to join us and, and thoroughly explain that as well. Uh, of course, um, make sure you get onto the Osprey website and look into those submissions that are due to close on September 30th. That's uh, Danny Templeman, the Extension Manager for Osprey. This is Sarah's Country. Growing a better world takes courage. It takes foresight and vision. It's about dreaming big, then being brave enough to follow that dream through. To create a world where food is plentiful, soils are healthy, and rivers run crystal clear. A world where we grow more with less, where livestock is tended to with care. Energy is friend, not foe, and waste is a valuable resource. 
This is the world you're already shaping through imagination, innovation, and determination. So as small steps become huge leaps, you move boldly forward. And Rabobank is there beside you to help grow a better world together. Welcome back to Serious Country and welcome to those who have just joined us live. Now, of course, uh, Danny Templeman was recorded uh, earlier today, so I wasn't able to put some of these questions coming through to him, but I do need to read it out because I don't think many are very impressed with Osprey's approach. Campbell Prendergast has said, Danny, it's been two years now since the TB was found in pigs. It's taking far too long to get the outbreak under control. And Michael Ross has said, uh, softly, softly, does this work for the affected farmers? So some more frustration there around the situation we just had on with uh, Danny Templeton, Templeman sorry, from Osprey. And uh, I am really enjoying the positive comments coming through. Of course, I'd love to talk about tonight. What are those special things that you do uh, with your children, with your grandchildren, or you used to do with your parents when you were younger, uh, when they we made time for each other uh, and got off farm, of course. Great to see John. John says, every child should have the pleasure of bottle feeding lambs. Totally agree. And hiking and camping in the mountains and watching the changes in the scar starscape. I had my first um, outdoor bath um, in, in Central Otago looking at the stars. And I discovered the app where you hold it over and over and all of the constellations come up. Blew my mind. It was incredible. Uh, no kids in the house, but have a little niece who I adore to bits. And my sister is in calf, calf at the moment. Anthony, please. One thing I'm going to teach you is don't refer to a woman like a cow, especially when she's pregnant. Fun tip for the day. I'm going to get to our next guest, who I'm sure will have some, some great stories. Now, of course, um, front page of Farmers Weekly, a great story. Uh, continuing to follow the freshwater uh, national policy standards from the government that have come down and how we are going to either adjust to this or will the government be making some amendments. We know that we're all in this freshwater quality mission together and uh, catchment groups have absolutely exploded, as particularly in the last five years. A great way to actually create a community group just as much and come together around learning over our own ecosystem. Farmers um, who want to improve them are being are urged to do this from the bottom up. And uh, Rangitakai Rivers Catchment Collective Chair Roger Dalrymple is one of those and joins us now. Roger, welcome to Sarah's Country. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Sarah. Enjoying to be here. Hey, so Roger, you're urging farmers to take a stronger footing to prove this verifiable data. What do you mean by that? Um, well, at the end of the day, um, Sarah, you know, we've all just been confronted with the new freshwater policies from the government, and that's all come from social pressure, pressure from science, uh, and I can list the scientists, we don't need to, but there's freshwater ecologists out there and there's social pressure that we're polluting our waterways and we're, and we're not actually looking after the environment to the, to the standard that, uh, that society wants, and so... Um, we need to understand that science ourselves. We need to get a better understanding so that we've actually got some tools in the toolbox. Um, when we get challenged again, and we will get challenged again, there's no doubt about that, um, so that we've got some, some, some data in the toolbox that we can use and say, well, actually, we're not polluting our soils or we're, or we're not polluting our waterways or we are looking after our ecosystem better than uh, is being generalised. Okay, we're talking about intergenerational um, here on Serious Country tonight and of course our next generation is why we do what we do. Now t tell us about the Catchment Collective that uh, looks after 
700,000 hectares in the Rangatakai, um, Turakina and uh, Whangahu River catchments. What type of work are these local catchment groups doing to be able to test and monitor um, these measurements of freshwater quality? Uh, good question, Sarah. Look, it's, 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 first of all, it's getting farmers on board. Um, we're not. We're not trying. To, we're, this isn't as a result of the freshwater policy thing. This is. This is getting an understanding of our environment. And uh, sure thing, we've got. We've got the um, freshwater policy thing, which has arrived. But community catchments aren't going to. Aren't going to fix that. They'll help guide farmers through it. But it's. It's getting people on board um, and helping educate farmers, um, taking small steps and understanding. If our farms are polluting, where they're polluting. Um, at the moment, our regional councils are doing uh, testing, but it's in quite a um, in a broad manner. Um, it's not specific enough. So, as as community catchments do it, they follow in their tributaries and they can do testing. But we can't really we don't want to, we don't want to focus solely on water testing. Mm. Um, it gets people in the room. There's no doubt about that because people love to know what is happening in their tributary. Mm. But it's actually a bigger, far bigger picture than just our waterways. Um, it's how we hold on to our soils. It's our biodiversity. It's 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 enhancing our community. Um, look, farming farming depends on our uh, ecosystem, um, and if we don't understand it, how can we actually capture it? It's it, what's what's available and. Uh, and make sure we look after it for generations to go forward. I so wanna, it's a long-term thing. Yeah, I want to discuss uh, your comments here about farm environment plans being like financial budgets, measuring income and outgoings. But, Roger, when uh, this particular style from top down is about inputs and doesn't really care too much about profit margins out the back end or outputs, which uh, farmers have been focusing on, which is uh, water quality, how do we actually treat that like a financial budget when we're so heavily focused on those inputs? Sarah, it's probably more about putting it on paper. Like we've all, we all know our farms intimately. We know the soil types. We know if we go to a certain part of a paddock that they might you'll get bogged. If you sneak around the edge, you know it's dry or whatever. So we know our farms intimately. It's putting that down on a piece of paper because we, we have to we, – having, having it in your head is no long – is no longer good enough. And it's the same with the budget. Um, many years ago, farmers did their budgets in their head. Hmm. And so that's that's where the comparison is. It's putting it down on a piece of paper so that you've got something that you can share with everyone on the farm, your bankers, um, uh, your bankers and, and everyone who you're working with on the farm so they understand what the long-term goal is, what the what the weak points of the farm are, which is the, which is the strong wintering country, which is the... Um, stuff that dries out, et cetera, et cetera. So it's writing it down so everyone involved in the business understands what the long-term goal is. And have some accountability and measurability around some of these achievements as well over time, I'd imagine. Correct. That, that's, that's a really important point. Um, like for other people to um, tell our story, which, which is what it's all about, because if I tell you I'm a really good farmer, you won't listen to me, but if other people tell you I'm a good farmer, they will. So having it written down and... And recording what we've got and what we've changed allows other people to to understand what we've got and what we, what and, and how we've changed over time and what improvements we've done. How have you been able to create a collective around the table approach with all the organisations in your collective catchments case? Uh, basically, just getting an understanding. Like we've been getting it top down for the last hundred and fifty years. Um, and, you know, you can't blame the government. That's their job. Um, they listen to social pressure. They listen to things, and they just set rules, and it's not just in, uh, just not just in the environment. So coming from the bottom up um, really sort of um, resonated with farmers. They said, shucks, yes, if we understand it and get some tools in our toolbox, understand our environment better, um, it, it, everyone just jumped on board. Um, they, they, they understand it, and it's not going to happen overnight. That's the important thing. It's, it's, it's a time thing. It's an intergenerational thing. There's no doubt about that. With this low slope covering a large majority of New Zealand, Roger, how do you mm. believe we're logistically and physically going to be able to fence off that amount of waterways and the huge amounts of stock water systems that are going to have to go in as well? Well, Sarah, that's, what, that's exactly what's wrong with it because it is huge. And it is, it is a, as a rule, it's a global rule for the whole country, but it's not actually, it shouldn't be. 
And, and that's why community catchments, if we could get to that level and let farmers decide where the key points are. Like we've got an example, I know it was written in the paper, that one farmer changed what he was going to do fencing-wise because of the results he got from the testing we were doing. And farmers know where the weak points are, but doing more testing and more understanding of, of what effects are, like a wool shed mm. has a huge effect. All wool sheds are planted beside um, streams because that's where it's dry and that's where the water is. But they're actually highly polluting things because there's so much manure going there that can flow in. So that's that's something that uh, you can discuss in community catchments and you can say, right, well, let's plant a whole lot of trees around there to try and capture that effluent um, to help look after that waterway. So it's, it's, it's just getting a better understanding. Uh, you're absolutely passionate and spend a lot of time in these river ways what about river mouths and uh we we're talking about earlier white baiting you must be a keen white baiter roger we're kicking white off the baiting, season yes, this week yes. yes i was very naive i was very naive when i was a lot younger um i was out the back of our farm on a motorbike and um uh, our shepherd our head shepherd was with me i was the boy and we went out to the um out to the uh, a little stream called hell's hole we've got a a, a um stream on our a, a paddock on our farm called hell's hole don't ask me how it was called it i assume lots of people got bogged in it i'm not sure but it's called hell's hole and it's called the hell's hole drain went out to the water mouth and here are all these things trying to get up it it was white bait if i'd known that at the time um we would have had a roiler uh, but no, white baiting is a, is a thing that is, is really important. That's one of the reasons why we look after our streams, um, because we all love white bait. It's a delicacy. And, you know, that could be some of the, that could be, that's a perfect example of what a community catchment could do. Rather than say we want to hit this level or that level, they might say we want to enhance our white bait. Um, so we don't have to actually measure it with nitrates and phosphates and things. We want to look after the ecology of the stream. So there's all sorts of ways of doing it. It's not just about science. Yeah, we had Rick Cameron on Sarah's Country uh, a week or so back, and he defined, say, regenerative agriculture as the measure of success is when the birds return, similar in terms of what you're saying there, Roger. Yeah, hey, mm. and, and yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I am very much looking forward to a feed of white bait from the Turakina. Uh, however, Roger, I made a very, very silly mistake whereby I skited about how I've eaten far too much white bait over the years and I've had so much of it, uh, you know, blah, 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 that this person decided to eat all of the white bait. So I'll know for next time to keep my mouth shut. I haven't had a feed for the season yet. What about yourself? No, not yet, but I've been, uh, I, I, I have been given a, a, a reasonable quantity in a butter container because um, we have pheasants on our farm and uh, a number of, uh, this guy came and he's brought one bought a box of chocolates and one bought a, a thing of white bait, so looking forward to that. Can yeah, I suggest put a lid on it and put it right at the back of your freezer so no one knows it's there? <laughs> <laughs> and just have Ro idea. Rogers only written on the top of it. Hey, thank you so yeah. much, Roger Del Rampel, joining us there with his hat on tonight as the chair of the um, Rangitakai Rivers Catchment Collective. And, of course, front page on Your Farmers Weekly this week. Now, coming home after the break, we're going to be joined by CEO for Palmu, Steve Carden. Uh, Palmu have had an incredible uh, annual result despite COVID, despite drought, despite what's happened to deer prices and dairy land values. Uh, how did they do it? All that after the break on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country. The recipe for perfect beef and lamb. Take one small fresh country. Make sure it's nice and remote. Keep it at the ideal temperature all year round. Next, mix in the farmers. They go perfectly with the nature of this unique place. Add regular sprinkles of rain to really bring out the lush meadow grass. Then let your animals happily graze on this grass, all day, every day. And there you have it, 
New Zealand. The perfect recipe for beef and lamb. Despite interruptions due to COVID, of course the drought and a fall in dairy property values, also a dramatic drop in deer prices, Palmu have had one of the best annual results that they have ever had. And a story in this week's Farmers Weekly by Colin Willis-Croft uh, outlines Palmu's latest annual results with a 91% improvement in operating profit before earnings, uh, earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortisation of 65 Five million dollars from 2019. Joining us now to discuss how the state-owned enterprise's diversification has seen them ride the storms of the past 12 months is CEO Steve Carden. Welcome to Sarah's Country, Steve. G'day, Sarah. Hey, this is an excellent result. What were some of those key points to the success of your performance? Yeah, well, I think given the sort of year it was, it's a really pleasing result, actually. it's um, We had a, obviously a lot of climatic challenges in the back half of the year in the North Island with uh, pretty significant drought, particularly up in Northland, and COVID caused headaches for everyone across the industry, particularly trying to get livestock off our properties. So in that context, it was great to see, obviously, milk prices were, were pretty positive for the year, uh, milk pr- Production is up across the country, which we're really pleased about, um, particularly given those climatic conditions. And, uh, you know, we did a pretty good job of keeping our costs under control in what was quite an uncertain year. So overall, very, very happy with that result. We talked there about dairy land property values and and an adjustment made there. Are you concerned at all? Well, for the last couple of years, we've seen our dairy land values decrease. They dropped by about 8% across the country over the last year. Uh, The livestock farms dropped by a couple of percent, so not nearly as significant. But I think clearly the fact that, um, you know, there's quite a degree of uncertainty about the outlook for dairy at the moment, the increasing level of regulation, the lack of foreign buyers, um, there just isn't the same level of demand in the market for those particularly the larger properties that we farm. So we are seeing those properties, property values come back. So how is this driving Palmu's diversification, particularly in more alternative milk such as spring sheep milk that you're heavily involved with and providing those alternative sources of income in dairy? Yeah, well, we've been looking at alternative dairy, what we call specialty dairy now for a couple of years. Um, Obviously, as you mentioned, spring sheep, uh, our sheep milking business has gone really well. And we're seeing the expansion of the sheep milking industry in the Waikato, which is exciting. Um, We've been doing deer milk uh, with our deer milking partners down near Gore. Uh, and we're expanding that business as well. And we've been quite heavily converting uh, some of our bovine, our cow dairy farms to organics. We've got now six organic farms across the countries and we're, we're quite excited with their performance, both financially, but also environmentally as well. Mm. Let's talk about deer, 86,000 deer Palmu run. How are you staying on track with your strategy there when deer has been so hit by COVID of all of the classes? Hmm. Yeah, deer has been a real challenge for us over the last year, as you'd expect. Um, most of the deer gets sold into Europe and into US, and, and predominantly it's into food service restaurants. And so obviously that's had a significant impact on the profitability of venison over the last six months after some very, very good prices for the last couple of years. So we are reassessing what our portfolio needs to look like across our, our deer business. You know, venison is a great product. It's a fantastic meat but it is a specialty premium meat. And and when economies start to close down and and retrench a bit, then people choose not to eat out as much. And we're seeing that with demand hitting venison sales. Um, But we're confident in the sector and and are hopeful that um, prices will rebound in the second half of next year. Okay, so we can't see uh, Lang Corporal Palmo putting deer farms and dairy farms on the market. There's uh, still a lot of passion there from your side. Oh, no, there's a huge amount of passion that we have for pastoral farming in general. We're extremely optimistic about the outlook, um, but I do think we are going through quite an adjustment as a sector at the moment. Obviously, it's difficult dealing with the uh, level of policy change that's happening across fresh, fresh water and zero carbon. 
uh, and biodiversity. But, you know, farmers are incredibly adaptive and resilient. And so long as we have enough time to adjust our systems and to, to adopt new technologies and farmers can change to meet the, the new expectations and standards. So, you know, we're very optimistic about what the future looks like. I certainly do want to get into discussing freshwater with you, Steve, and how your team are adjusting with what the current uh, standards that are on the table. But before we do that, another diversification is, of course, horticulture and uh, avocados in particular. Whereabouts does that sort of strategy look like for Palmu going forward and investing more in the hort sector? Mm. Well, we've been around for about 130 years now, Sarah, and we've never, ever uh, run commercial crops before. So this is quite a significant shift for Palma in terms of our land use diversification strategy. So we're trying new alternative land uses across our portfolio. And up in the far north, uh, we've developed a 40 hectare avocado block, which is um, in its second year of development going very well at this point. And it's about us trying to use land for its best and highest use. And we are necessary, that is often uh, commercial cropping. Uh, And so we are looking to expand our horticulture business, which is very small at the moment, but which will get bigger over time. And likewise, we've been doing quite a bit in in forestry. We are converting about 2,000 hectares of of land into forestry on some of our livestock properties. We're very very careful that that is only class six land and above that we're converting. We absolutely want to retain the strength and vibrancy of our our livestock farms and make sure we're uh, investing some of the money we're making in forestry now back into our livestock business to ensure it it can adjust and change and be strong for the future. So uh, Palmu created a freshwater group that had the likes of Dr Mike Joy and Alison Jews on it and at the time people thought uh, where was Steve going with this concept but when you put the national policy standards for freshwater as they stand today uh, from Minister David Parker and MFE where is the advice of um, positioning Palmu to be prepared for these types of standards did they come as a shock to you or were you quite ready for this? Well, I think many of the sector have been anticipating uh, water reform for quite some time, Sarah. So getting the that environmental reference group you mentioned set up uh, about five years ago was us realising we had to get our head into a different space around environmental constraints and starting to change our farm systems accordingly. And that group of external advisors came in and were quite challenging to us um, as a farming business. And it was a really good two-way flow of information about the realities of farming as we saw them and the challenges they were seeing in the environmental space that we needed to confront with our farms. And so we have been working on this for a while, but that's not to say that the changes required by the essential fresh water reforms are not significant. They are. They're difficult to adjust our farm systems to. We're doing a lot of work right around the country in new technologies that can help us reduce the rate of fertiliser application. Uh, we're de-intensifying in quite a few areas and moving to the likes of organic farm systems, which allow us to um, you know, have a lower environmental footprint plus get a premium for our, our products. Um, and we are looking at new technologies that allow us to to farm sort of smarter and with a, a smaller footprint. So we are facing into these issues, but they're not without their challenges. And, you know, a part of, I think, Palmu's role in the sector is to take our learnings and, and the insights we get from some of the experiments we do and make sure we take those learnings out to the private sector so they can to learn from us what's worked and what hasn't worked and, and hopefully adopt some of those changes in their farming practices. I know our audience will be thinking there'll be a large percentage of uh, maps that cover Palmu Farm that will be under low slope. How are you going to be able to adjust your winter grazing program, in particular in those Southland farms? Mm. Yeah, well, this is a very hot topic for us at the moment, as it is for many in the far south. How do we uh, reduce our reliance on winter cropping? Um, we have been working pretty hard over the last couple of years to to slowly change our farm systems to reduce the amount of winter cropping we are employing, particularly on those low sloped lands um, across our deer our portfolio in particular. And it does take a while. We're, we've got one farm which is doing an all grass wintering system at the moment very successfully. So we've learned from that and are now looking to extend that into a few of our other farms. Um, we're being very careful with our fencing, um, the layoff areas. Uh, are all starting to work, but, you know, we still make mistakes and uh, there are situations where we get it wrong after a heavy rainfall event and we get caught out. And I think, you know, farmers are after, we know where we need to end up. We need to pretty significantly reduce winter cropping across our portfolio where we can, but we just need the time to make those adjustments so that we look after our people, look after the animals and, and do what's right for the environment at the same time. 
Uh, coming up next to close the show, Steve, we have Malcolm Allison from LIC about a rise in demand for sex semen and uh, a drive to reduce bobby calves. How is Palmu uh, pro- provide, getting advice from the industry to position its livestock business to be better in terms of animal welfare, in particular with bobby calves? Mm. Yeah, again, that's a, a, another really challenging topic, um, Sarah, that we're trying to work through. How do we get sort of bobby-free um, dairy systems uh, developed? Uh, we've now at the point as a business where we raise about 7,000 dairy calves uh, in addition to those that are, are replacements. Um, many of those are going into our bull beef program that we're developing with our livestock business, which is what we call techno beef, uh, which has been quite an exciting farm system development in a livestock business. And we are transferring other uh, bobby calves into our traditional breeding and finishing programs. Um, so that's all going quite well. And that's a significant step forward from where we were even four or five years ago uh, in terms of those numbers. Uh, we recognize that consumer expectations about how animals are looked after are changing quite quickly. And practices that we've regarded as commonplace in farming for decades, if not centuries, are suddenly unacceptable. And we need to continue to adjust our farm systems to sort of stay ahead or at least with the expectations that our consumers who buy our products have about um, how, how we're producing that food. So we're making some headway and it's great to see that the genetics companies are developing sex semen uh, solutions, which will allow us to you know, increasingly reduce our reliance on, on bobby calf uh, culls. Mm. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us, uh, Steve, on Serious Country. First time, actually. It's a privilege to have you here, CEO for Palmu, Steve Carden. And uh, for those of you wondering, coming up, Sex Semen, what is that? If you do not know, stick around and see how it is set to reduce bobby calf numbers. And as Steve pointed out, a zero bobby calf uh, environment and ecosystem, will, the ones that are left behind can, of course, be destined for better quality export markets. All that coming up after the break on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country. pleased we got into this. Thanks for your help, Dave. It's a good idea, honey. You reckon it'll come out? Cover it and tell compare to leave it 10 minutes, and you'll be fine. Good call, Dave. Good call on getting those security cameras, Dave. You call a new one yet? Yeah, kind of. When you've got decisions to make, we'll be there to help you make the right call. I'd go for those ones, Bob. Yeah, good call. Did you choose these? Oh, you know. For great advice and insurance, talk to FMG. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop for the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or horsey. Or bee suits. Children. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But at Farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm, grow, milk, dredge. We're here. Come on in. Because we're out here too. Sorry, you're up. Hey, so I was just actually reading um, quite a long comment down here in regards to the continued conversation in the comments uh, after Danny Templeman's uh, from Osprey's interview at the start of the show with regards to a cost to one of the farmers of one hundred and fifty to 200000 to their operation, losing their C10 status back to C1 by being TB infected. If forestry and trusts want to farm pigs, deer and possum, then why don't they have to put a 10-foot high predator-proof fence? Can farmers take the landowners to court if this was uh, the source of the outbreak? It is certainly a developing story and uh, something I know that Farmers Weekly will be following very closely as we have a change of land use across the country, and particularly those forestry blocks and those large Māori blocks, um, as is the story in Farmers Weekly. 
Now, we are also talking about great things that you enjoy doing with your kids and your grandkids and what you used to enjoy doing with your family, your parents. Um, great one here from Brett. Mum and Dad took us to the beach or to the farm. And at the beach, they used to dig out puppies and cockles and lived off the sea. And they used to go on missions hunting for rats with the dog, which is pretty cool. Kids love to go earling, catch and release and spotting rabbits. Spent my life doing that, Campbell. I totally agree. It's a great sport. <laughs> now, getting on to our last interview for the evening, the drive to reduce bobby calves in the industry is seeing a surge in demand for sex semen. So what is sex semen for those who are not familiar with the term? Well, it is semen whereby there is a 90% chance when you utilize a particular gender of semen that it will turn out to be a heifer calf. And this is to reduce wastage in the dairy industry. But also it comes with some positive benefits and that is genetic gain. L- obviously less cows on uh, less land. Joining us now is LIC General Manager for the New Zealand Markets, Malcolm Ellis. Good evening, Malcolm. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is a, this is positive news. Yeah, it is, Sarah. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to spend some time with you tonight. Um, I think it is a really positive story because it, um, it, it really finds a really nice sweet spot for farmers on a number of fronts. Um, you talked a moment ago around that sort of reality of cow peak and if we're not milking more cows, we need to be milking better cows. But what's really important is that we identify the very best cows to breed from. So targeted use of sex semen um, has a real role to play there. Okay, so I suppose um, let's go back to it. How do you do this in the laboratory? And, and this is relatively new, isn't it? How, how new is it? Oh, so, so the technology on the, and the, the principle of sex disordered semen um, has been around for some time, to be honest. Um, there is a big breakthrough around this in the last couple of years, which I'll go to in a couple of moments. But but effectively, this is a real busy time um, on the cooperative's um, bull stable. At this time of the year, we're only a month away from dispatching um, upwards of 100,000 fresh jaws of semen each day. And we'll do that for um, upwards of two towards three weeks. Um, but that is conventional semen. That is the traditional roll the dice on a heifer or a bull. This situation is where we collect the ejaculate through the normal means that we would, uh, and then we actually take an extra step where we sex sort the semen so that we can um, separate off uh, that uh, that sperm that will produce um, heifer calf outcome or a 90% chance of that. Now, we're talking about genetic gain and accelerating that uh, with being able to produce more heifer calves as opposed to bull beef. Uh, and the, let's talk about, say, for instance, the Embovis colour. There was a huge amount of genetic loss from that. Is that you know going to be a really good alternative to bounce back to where we are in a short amount of time? Yeah, I'm extremely conscious um, of the the cull and the situation that involved and still continues to haunt our sector in some respects around the Embovis. But um, I also think from a genetic gain perspective, it's it's even bigger than that because on every individual farm, there is a bell-shaped curve of cow performance, but also of cow genetic merit. And, and sex semen is a real opportunity for farmers to be able to really hone in on the quality of those most elite cows and drive a higher proportion of their replacements from those cows. We know that there is a significant range in productive um, ability of the national herd, and I think a lot of that range has been born out of the significant cow growth we saw over a couple of decades. And so now there's that opportunity to just knuckle down, focus um, our sort of our genetic attention on those really elite cows um, and and so we're seeing farmers mating only their top uh, you know 50 60 70 percent of their herd to create the replacements for the next generation Sarah uh, and then designating those remaining poor productive cows to something quite different and, and maybe that's a targeted beef outcome yes of course we had um, Jared Hickey from first light talking about that with the wagyu calves uh, just last week Malcolm I'm just I'm just thinking here from a sheep and beef farmer's perspective. Seventy percent of our beef is made up from from bull beef out of the dairy industry, and in particularly more the cash flow of the dairy bull beef finishing uh, opportunity in the mix of a lot of these sheep and beef farmers. If that if the sex semen is on you know as you see here tripling in sales, that is going to have a, a flow on effect to lots of parts of this whole industry. 
It is. I, and, and that's where I think I said at the outset, it is an exciting piece, this, because it's it's exciting for New Zealand Agri. It's more than just dairy, um, and the advantages will flow on. Um, we've sort of focused a little bit in the last few moments around that increased rate of genetic gain for dairy farmers, but it also means that we can put a lot of focus on the targeted beef, dairy beef outcome, because you're absolutely right that 70% of our um, beef um, population is, is, has a dairy origin, born on our dairy farms, dairy beef, and, and if we can target um, a particular um, a gene- a rate of genetic gain even amongst that beef aspect, uh, we, put, we can put a lot more focus on, on, the, on the positive outcomes from that part of the equation as well. And so in recent times, certainly over the last two or three years, and we really ramped it up this year, um, LIC has put a huge uh, focus on, on that beef genetic um, aspect and making sure that not only have we got a high quality dairy stable for our farmers to drive the rate of genetic gain from the heifer replacements, but let's make sure we've got really high quality beef options. Um, you mentioned Wagyu, just being one, um, Hereford Angus, just a number of breed options, but let's not just create any old dairy beef, let's look to target really good quality um, beef outcomes from the dairy industry. Uh, and in this uh, article that Gerald Pickett has done for farmersweekly.co.nz titled uh, Sex Semen Demand Surges Among Farmers, there's a number of examples there of different farming organisations that have a part of their farming strategy from an animal welfare perspective that, uh, to, to have a zero bobby calf strategy. This this is certainly taking off. Is sex semen a, a lot more expensive? Sorry for my ignorance. Um, and if so, why is it or isn't? And are you trying to make this readily available? It, it is more expensive, but but um, from a per straw um, uh, uh, scenario, it is more expensive than conventional straw. But then remember that the value proposition of being able to target that high quality, high genetic merit heifer outcome alongside the bull calf that is um, more of a designer outcome than what otherwise may have been expected is seen really good on farm commercial examples of a noticeably more profitable outcome. And I think, Sarah, to be honest, that's what's really driving this. I mean, we have seen a surge of demand. That is a very accurate term. Three times the level of uptake uh, for this coming mating season. And I'm really impressed by how innovative our farmers are, where they are looking at their own situation, their own farming entity. Maybe they've got an opportunity to finish that beef, dairy beef outcome. Maybe they've got a market to on-sell it. I'm just really impressed that every time I engage personally in a conversation with farmers around the use of sex semen, um, they've got a different, unique story about the way they want to go about this. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we talked about the rate of genetic gain, but that animal welfare consideration associated with bobby calves, I think there's a lot of emotion around that and people are wanting, farmers are wanting to have a positive personal impact on the bobby calf footprint or number of bobby calves born on farm. I mean, it is a reality that there's 1.6 to 1.8 million of these bobby calves produced each year. And can we um, identify outcomes and produce outcomes that can have a, as I say, a much a richer, much wider reaching uh, positive impact for New Zealand Agri than just our New Zealand dairy farmers? Okay, so from a target perspective, what do you believe is achievable? Of course, um, LIC will have a graph on the whiteboard up and the Waikato, but um, I mean, what what do you believe what we can, can do? And then what a wonderful PR story we should be telling nationwide when we achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. So we, so like last year, we um, we sold just uh, just under thirty four thousand straws. This year, we ticked over a hundred thousand a week ago, um, sitting just above that now. Um, and we are just watching this growth and this um, appetite really closely because obviously there are changes that we need to make in our delivery system uh, within our lab um, setup. We are well set to deliver this demand this year, um, but in the past, the the fresh semen delivery has been three days. Dispatches uh, around the country um, with the sex semen, um, we, we deliver that out to our, our wonderful t- AB Tech Force on a daily basis. So daily dispatch. So it's a it's a slightly more complex delivery um, setup. Uh, so we've got to make sure we're um, really responsible with the way we we grow this product because we want to deliver a really good experience for our farmers. 
Hey, thank you so much, Malcolm. I'm not going to let you go straight away. Um, I've actually got here, oh, Andrew Whiffin. Hello, Andrew. Hope you're well. Uh, the problem is that this is fine in theory, but LAC sex semen has traditionally been lower quality than conventional, causing less days in milk. What is LAC doing in regards to dual purpose breeds such as Flick V? Flick? Yeah, so let's just touch on the first part of that, um, more specifically than the individual breed piece. But, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier a, a point there around the breakthrough or what we've identified in recent years. So sex semen or sex sorting is not new, like I, I said previously, but the real breakthrough is the advantage of fresh sex semen. And that is that um, daily dispatch um, collection, we're not deep freezing, we're just sex sorting and fresh semen that's dispatched around the country. Now, I think um, the talk of the differential with uh, non-return rates is often associated with people's experience with frozen um, sex semen, which has normally been a differential with conventional of about a minus 13, minus 15, up to sort of minus 18 or 20%, which is just, I can't stomach that. Like um, the days in milk is so valuable to the farm system. But what we have found is fresh sex semen is where the breakthrough is and of the, the um, inseminations we conducted last year um, Sarah we shortened that kind of minus 15 to minus 18 day uh, sorry minus 15 minus 18 percent uh, differential of non-return rate right up to minus 3.7 and so we're more in that minus 3.7 to minus 5 and this is the real breakthrough this is game on now when we can deploy the most elite New Zealand bovine genetics from within the cooperative stable with fresh semen technology uh, at minus 3.7, that is why farmers are uh, lapping this up. Like, this is a complete product now. There we go. Andrew, hopefully that answered your question. And uh, as I was going to say, as I'm going into the other comments that are coming through, Malcolm, what are those cherished moments with either your children or when you were a child that you used to enjoy doing with your parents or you enjoy doing with your children out and about around the country? Oh, look, I'm a fourth generation dairy farmer and um, I have very, very good memories being um, the middle child. I'm not going to complain about that, but one of three boys. Um, but, you know, family in the summer, um, we absolutely cherish that. Uh, and now I'm just incredibly grateful and mindful of, the, of creating those opportunities with our own family for Jody and I and our three kids. So, yeah, and I think with farm backgrounds, you um, you certainly cherish and remember those times because we respect that our um, our parents work really hard in this industry over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Malcolm Atlas, the General Manager for the New Zealand Market there from LIC. I was just thinking about that. My dad had the pleasure, has the pleasure of three females um, that he didn't get to select fresh um, and I don't think he'd change it for the world so and we'd have some great great memories I'm just going to go down here John Williams posh, possum shooting is always a highlight um, excuse me I'm just getting a bit huffy Jock, pin, uh, picnicking and swimming at the local river is always popular ponies skiing fishing always remember tickling trout and uh, hoping it's not an eel Great work, everybody. Thank you so much for sending in so many great live comments. And thank you so much to all of our wonderful guests on the show. Thank you so much also to my wonderful producers, Joel and Dan, tonight. We'll do this again tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, uh, right back here in association with the great people at Farmers Weekly. New email address, actually. We've changed the website, sarahscountry.com. So send me an email, sarah at sarahscountry.com. Really easy to remember. Any guests and topics that you'd love to hear and have on the show, any feedback or any cool fun stories that you think that we should be sharing. In the meantime, good night and go well, and we'll see you again tomorrow night. This is Sarah's Country.